isn't it interesting? If you think back at your life as you were growing up and as you've gotten older, your perspective of life is quite interesting. As a young person, you seem like you're chasing the future. And the future cannot get to you fast enough. And then just about when you think you've reached the time uh, when you were enjoying life and you're getting some kind of respect, some kind of uh, established footing in life, you find out that you're trying to slow life down and you can't. It seems like there's no brakes on this. And no matter how old you are, you still think that you are 18 years old. One thing that I keep laughing with my dad, which I think every one of you feel the same way, you look at other people which are maybe same age as you are, and some even younger than you are, and you think like, man, they're old. And then you look in the mirror, you're like, wait a minute, what happened to me? And as a young person, you grow up and you're being told that gray hair means what? Wisdom. And you look up from that low stature at taller people and you wonder, wow, they know all things. But the older you grow, you find out that as you're getting gray hair, you find out that you know less than what you knew when you were younger. Actually, the wiser you get, the more you realize that some people have forgotten more than you have ever will have learned. And, and interestingly enough, where you expect wisdom from gray hair, you actually find something that's quite opposite sometimes, at times from your own self. Where you think you would have learned about life, you actually are acting like a child many times. And the one thing you come across at a certain age is that saying, which is not from Solomon, it's something that we have come up with, and it begins with, old dogs... Yeah, you know it. Old dogs, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Depends from what perspective you say it. Because if you're looking at an old dog and he doesn't want new tricks, you're frustrated. If you are the old dog, you're frustrated because you're expected to learn new tricks. You're like, I'm done learning new tricks. Teachability is something that we fight with from a young age. When we're young, we want to do it our way. When we turn a certain age, like that famous song, you say, I did it my way. I'm not going to learn anything. There's nothing you can teach me. Actually, you need to listen to me. It's the kind of spirit that God has been fighting with with our hearts from the time that we were created. When the enemy came to Adam and Eve, actually to Eve first, and told her, listen, you will know everything. All you got to do is eat this, and you'll be like God. And ever since, man has always wanted to sit on that throne, teaching instead of being taught. A teachable spirit. It's something that we learn as we come across this message and this text this morning. And interestingly enough, we may learn about having a teachable spirit from a very special, unexpected place. A teachable spirit, the Bible talks about a teachable spirit. It's more valuable than gold. Employers, actually, at times, when they're wise enough themselves, they appreciate a teachable spirit more than education and experience. Many companies, actually, they will take you as you are. If you're ready to learn, we'll teach you because they want you to learn their way, right? A teachable spirit is something that the Lord talked about as often. And actually, Solomon, in Proverbs 18, verse 5, he says, The heart of the understanding acquires knowledge. There's that idea of understanding once we are um, connected to what Scripture teaches to understand things that we can't grasp. It's what God does to us. He teaches us, and we get understanding. In the year of the wise, they seek knowledge. What can we learn this morning on this road to a temple, to Calvary? Many times we approach the scriptures and God with our own expectations. We actually pray, asking for God to answer our prayers, and we also give them, by the way, do it this way. And God said, I'm fighting with you to be teachable. So ask yourself the question, how teachable am I? 
Because that would have to also be, am I teachable only from certain people that I respect? Am I teachable from only circumstances that actually are beneficial to me? How teachable am I? Well, actually, that answer will be a guide into your heart, for your heart, through situations, perspectives, circumstances that you're dealing with. Proverbs 3.13, how blessed is the man that finds wisdom and the man who obtains discernment. Because wisdom and discernment, he puts it forward as a she, her profit is better than the profit of silver and her produce better than fine gold. So instead of asking for money, instead of asking for benefits, look for wisdom and discernment. Who can teach us this morning about wisdom and discernment? The idea that Wisdom can teach us to see things that have been in front of your eyes all this time and you've never seen it. What do you mean, Philip, show us the Father? I've been with you all this time. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They were in the midst of divinity and you were asking for more. Don't we do that? Oh God, more. Oh God, how about something else? Lord, change this. Give me that. Take me there. And the Lord said, it's been right there. Who can teach us about having our eyes opened to see the unseen? Therefore, having our lives saved from circumstances and situations. The Lord says, Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Let's do a, a checkup this morning. A spiritual optometry test and a spiritual ear test. How well can you hear when God speaks? When God tells you to go or stop or be quiet or speak up? Can you hear? As we draw to Jerusalem, there's multitudes and throngs of people coming to, to be part of this festivity, this Passover, this annual feast that draw crowds from all over. And they're seeking and they're looking and they're asking and they're seeking to see Jesus, expecting to get more things from Jesus. He fed us. He healed us. Let's go again and see what else we can get from Jesus. Sometimes we, we come to church that way. Let's see what God has to give us. But then you ask yourself, is that real worship or am I going there with an agenda? And here they are pushing and they want to hear and see. They want to make him king as they did before. When he fed them, who doesn't want this welfare state? Feed us, you can be our king. So because he has done that, because he, he raised Lazarus from the dead, let's go near Jesus. Bring him your illnesses and your wants. And God will answer. John 7, 11 says, So the Jews were seeking him as the feast, and they were getting frustrated because they weren't seeing him. Kind of like us at times. We're praying. We're telling God what to do. We, we want to get away from. We're asking for a detour. We're asking for a rapture. And we're saying, where is God? Who can teach us to see things that the world does not see? To actually see Jesus. John 12, 20 talks about these Greeks. They came to Philip and they weren't asking for bread or fish or healings. They went to Philip and said, listen, listen, we want to see Jesus. What does that mean? When you say you want to see Jesus, what does that mean? To Saul, being transformed into Paul meant blindness. Meant dropping his agenda, his direction, his way to do what he wanted in the, in the religious world. And saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And being questioned. You're persecuting me. What you think you're doing, you think it's right. The way you're treating people and the way you're judging people, you think it's right, but you're persecuting me. What does it mean to see Jesus? God uses a multitude of venues to speak to our hearts. So, in doing so, we would understand His will for us today. Tomorrow, 
to unveil his grace. He speaks to us in many circumstances through people you don't expect and situations. And he touches your heart and your eyes open. He uses all of these circumstances to teach us to be obedient and trusting. Trusting and obeying. Solomon was aware of that and God used him in his wisdom. And God uses all of the national geographic spectrum to teach us. Right? We, learn, we see that we learn from our pets. My dogs taught me what it means to be grateful, what it means to be obedient, what it means to be joyful, even loving. We, we talk about, right, your, your pets, your, your part of the family. Look at what Solomon says. Go to the ant, oh, you sluggard. Go to the ant. Observe her ways and be wise. Pay attention, take notes, and see what God has instilled even in the ant. There's something to learn there. The ants are not a strong people. They prepare their food in the summer. Jay, did you know that your friends in the backyard there, those ruck chucks, they're in the Bible. They're called a sephonim. I was reading this. I'm like, what in the world is sephonim? It's a rock badger. It's a rock chuck. I'm so sorry I shot so many. <laughs> I should have learned from them. It says here, the Sephanim are not a mighty people, yet they make their houses in the cliff. And all of the tunnels they have in the back farmland over there where Jerry is and the way that they, they peek out and go run back in and, and they're multiplying and living. They're a big army, not a mighty people, but they know how to hide. Go to the locusts, the lizard, the lion, even the rooster. Go and learn. So... This morning, while Jesus tells the Pharisees, listen, if the children would not praise my name, if we as God's people don't understand what it means to praise the Lord Jesus on Thursday afternoon at 3 p.m. or on Tuesday at 8 a.m., not just on Sunday, if we don't know how to praise his name through everything we're going through, Jesus says, I can make these rocks cry out. So, how about a donkey teach us a few things this morning? We want to enter this week learning from a donkey, a towel, and a rooster. All of these things that until now we took for granted and, and just passed over and never paid attention. And God says, watch them, learn from them, from their witness, their testimony. And don't you know that a donkey speaks? One did a long time ago. Have you ever seen a donkey bray? Their lips go up and they do this. And, oh, they're just hilarious. I see more and more on YouTube. And I see how affectionate they are and how they run to their owners. They're a very interesting animal. There's donkeys all over Scripture. I told my wife, I'm not going to use the King James Version, especially in this text, because you can make a thousand jokes about donkeys this morning. Right? But God wants to teach us from unexpected places. In this, in this case... Let's learn some quiet lessons. Some quiet lessons that make us go, hmm. Some lessons that will change our lives. And God says, see, watch this. I've done this for you in unexpected places and times to draw up a picture of the culminating point of my son, Jesus. Quiet lessons of strength from a donkey. Actually, several donkeys and they all point to their creator Jesus Matthew 21 5 says say to the daughter of Zion behold your king is coming to you and here how here's how he will come he'll be lowly he'll be humble Way back, hundreds of years before, he tells them, this is going to be your Messiah, your King. Not in the way you expect it. He's coming humble. And you'll recognize him because he's going to come on a donkey, mounted on a donkey. And on a colt. Wait a minute. We'll answer this question because you've got to ask the question, wait, was Jesus straddling? Was he doing a circus act here? Or with one leg on one? On, what, what was happening here? And the possibility of the Lord's love and compassion will just amaze you in the smallest thing. What it means that he was riding on a donkey and on a foal of a donkey, cold, a colt, 
the foal of a pack animal. And we see donkeys all over Scripture. They're portrayed as symbols of service, humility, suffering. And for a king to ride a donkey, a symbol of peace and coming justice. Jesus asked for a donkey. He could have asked for a horse, which is what Judas wanted. And Peter, the sons of thunder, a horse, come in ruling. We've been waiting to take this yoke off our backs. That's how you feel sometimes about your enemies and all your brothers and sisters. And you're thinking, one day I will show them. I will show them. I will defeat them through my success. So we build our lives in order to finally get one up. But Jesus comes on a donkey to show that the kingship that God had given him was not from man, but from God. Not what he was going to do, but his father. We learn throughout all of this path to the temple on this donkey. It's a road of love, submission, trust, obedience. Are those qualities part of my life and yours? Loving and living the way we do in obedience and submitting because we love Him. Understanding what it means to submit. What it means to be focused and be perseverant no matter what. Because of Him. A colt is a young male donkey that's less than four years old. Not as strong as a mature donkey. Often ridden by a king, a new king, that showed a transfer of rulership. A new king is in line. He comes in to bring peace. When a king would go to war, he'd be on a horse. When he came to peace, he'd be on a donkey. Jesus could have chosen to ride on a powerful horse, which one day he will. But when he comes to us, when he comes to his own people, he comes to heal to redeem, to forgive. So when you go to your family's homes and your friends' homes, make sure you're on a donkey, not on a horse. We got the saying, get off your high horse, pointing down and judging and commanding. Doing so, he actually fulfills this prophecy from Zechariah, which is the quote that we have in Matthew. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Make a loud shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. You've been in darkness. You've been subjugated. You've been suffering. But rejoice. Think of the situation that you're in. Think of the burden. Think of the fear. Think of the ultimate logical conclusion that your darkness takes you to. Thinking you're going to wind up under a bridge in a tent, forgotten, left behind, dying. It's a situation of our hearts. Scripture says, rejoice. Cry out loud. Behold, your king is coming to you. The path he's taking to the temple is not to be revered, but to be sacrificed as the lamb. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, lowly, humble, and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the fall, the fall of a pack animal. Therefore, Jesus' approach and arrival is a symbol of final peace. And that's what God wants to give you and me this morning. Because we were once an enmity. We were at war, always under God's judgment. But now because of Jesus on a donkey, there's peace. What can we learn this morning? Well, 
great if we look deep on this road and path and all God has been teaching us throughout history, biblical history that is, where donkeys have been involved, which actually take place on this path. First thing we learn, that in the heart of Jesus, on this donkey he was riding, if this donkey could speak as one of his ancestors did 2,000 years before, this donkey would look and see Jesus and his ministry and he would see in the heart of Jesus as he serves his father, he sees earnest obedience. We need to say the word earnest because there's many types of obedience, right? You can be beaten into obedience. You can be subjugated. You can be forced into obedience. In this case, the Lord's path is earnest, desiring from deep down inside, sincerely choosing to be obedient. And that can only be born out of love. On this path, as the Lord rides these donkeys, we look back at his whole life. And we see nothing but love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. John 15, verse 9 through 10 says, Just as a father has loved me, I have also loved you. So the way I carry myself, it's a way that you can approach me. So I'm going to be on a donkey at the same level, even lower than you are, so you can approach me so we can be connected, not on a horse. I've loved you. So because I've loved you, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, because this answers the question, well, how do we abide in God's love? What does it mean to love Jesus? Is it just singing a song and saying, I love you? My wife will always tell me that's not enough. I ask my wife, hey, if I were to drive a Formula One car, would that be impressive? She said, no, washing the dishes would impress me. What does it mean to love God? Obey my commandments. Keep my commandments. Because when you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I've spoken to you. I've spoken them to you so my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Not half measures You'll be overwhelmed with this joy because now you're in my love because you're keeping my commandments. What does it mean to serve the Lord? Let's look back at 2,000 years before this walk, this path, 2,000 years before Jesus, on the same road, on the same mountain, another father, another beloved son on a donkey. Preparing and walking towards sacrifice. And all of that taking place so we can understand what's about to take place on this mountain that Jesus is walking on. If that donkey that was with Abraham and Isaac, if he could speak, what would that donkey say? What do you see as a witness to this father that's torn to pieces between loving God as following God from one place to another towards the land of promise and a people that were promised to him, giving him the promised son? Now, God said, you love me. Okay, show me. I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. What would this donkey say? Genesis 22, verse 2. Then he said, this is God talking to Abraham. Take now your son. Which son? Your only son. Okay, my son, my only son. What do you mean? Oh no, the son whom you love. And if you haven't gotten it yet, Isaac. Isaac. God is specific, specific to you and me, that when he taps you on your shoulder, when there's something, an idol may have crept in your life, God goes, mm, that idol, which one? The gold one. What do you mean? The one you paid a lot of money for. Oh, you mean that one. Specific. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Now, in having said that, look at the timing 2,000 years before to God. There's no time. Isn't God possibly describing 
the passion of his own heart, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Hear the echoes of God's painting of what his love means for you and me. Take your son Isaac and you got to go to Moriah, which actually is the Temple Mount Calvary in Jerusalem. Same place, same mountain, 2,000 years before. And offer him, there is a burnt offering on the mountains, which I will tell you. So Abraham, having received this command, does not argue, does not ask for clarification, does not wail and weep. Abraham rose early in the morning, committed to what God had told him, having followed him and having trusted him, what God told him remains true, even though God may seem to be asking for the impossible. Abraham wakes up early in the morning and he saddles his donkey. What would his donkey say? He took two of his men with him and Isaac, his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And catch this. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. Do you know that it is believed, and it makes perfect biblical sense, that in Abraham's heart... Isaac died the day that God asked him to bring him as a sacrifice. There was no doubt. There was no, oh, I hope maybe God changes his mind on the way up there. Because we do that. See, we know the Bible. We know his circumstances. And we say, okay, if I do two-thirds of the way, maybe God will relent, right? And God won't maybe go all the way through with this situation. And Abraham did not read the book of Genesis. He had no idea what God was about to do. But in Abraham's heart, Isaac was dead the day that God asked for it. And on the third day... When they got up to the top, as he was about to sacrifice his own son, God provided a ram. And his son was given back to him. Actually, that's what he tells the men that are with him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from a distance. What did the donkey see that day in this walk? What do you hear between Abraham and his son? He could have seen love, a torn love between a father, his son, and his God. A God that just asked for the impossible. If he would have completed, then he would have been completely going through with his point of obedience. This would validate the very promise God made. I'm going to give you a legacy, children, a people. You can't count the stars as many as I'm going to give to you. And now God says, take it all away. All because of love. This was God's way of painting the picture of his own broken heart. For his son that would not stop on that day. No one would stay the hands of the Roman soldiers. Every time I watch The Passion or any movie with the Lord Jesus, it's funny, but every time I watch it, even though if it went to happen the way I would think would be in big trouble, because when he goes before Pilate, I'm thinking, say yes, Pilate, this time. This time, let him go. Come on, one good argument. Let him go this time. Right? Right? Peter said that. Oh no, you're not going to go. This is not going to happen to you. And yet Jesus, when he cries out, his father does not answer. The hand is not held back. Here we are on the same mountain, same path, a father, a son, and a donkey. And I caught something that is quite affectionate which again paints the picture of God's heart. Look at Genesis 22, 6 and verse 8. Verse 6 and verse 8, because this repeats for importance. Then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and put it on Isaac, his son. So until now, it is possible that this donkey on his back 
was the wood. I remember as a child uh, hiking with my dad back in Romania, and we would go in uh, f- complete heights, a uh, wilderness away from people, from one cabin to another. And at times we would follow the locals that would carry supplies to those cabins, and there would be donkeys. I remember as yesterday at the age of seven watching their hoofs navigating those rocks and stepping ever so slowly but ever so carefully having that weight on their backs a beast of burden we could learn from that could we not not a rampaging horse that runs in its beauty but a beast that just carries the burden in obedience from one place to another. And here is this donkey carrying the wood, the wood that would be used to sacrifice and burn Isaac. At this point, they take the wood away from the donkey and they put it on Isaac's back. And maybe for a while, Isaac was himself riding the donkey as a picture, as a type of what Jesus would do. Took the wood of the burnt offering and put it on Isaac, his son. The wood the cross on Jesus and he took in his hand the fire and the knife listen to this so the two of them walked together Abraham Isaac telling the young man my son and I are going to go to worship we're going to go to worship and then we will return The depth of that faith, the love for God the Father, understanding the love God gave him for his own son. I will give this to my father because I love him and God will provide. Verse 8, and Abraham said, God will provide for himself because Isaac said, hey, I get it. I get it. Here's the wood. I see the fire. Let's not talk about the knife just yet. I see we're ready, but where is the lamb? Where is that sacrifice? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked together. Even as Abraham is sifting through his heart, the values and the things that he loved in his life. Whom does he love the most? He's answering his son. Isaac spoke to Abraham. He said, my father. Can you hear the echo? My father. This one is being answered. But when the Lord Jesus cries out, my God, my God, my father, not this cup, not now. Abraham answers, here I am, my son. Where is the lamb? Isaac receives an answer. Jesus does not. When Jesus cries out, not this cup, father, When he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is no answer. And yet, later on in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, we learn that God was in Christ, making peace the world to himself. In Abraham's heart, At that point, Isaac was dead three days before. He was about to receive his son back. Obedience. We see this, and that donkey would tell us, as he is being led, as he is carrying the burden, he he would watch and see a father about to give up the love of his life, the promise of the future, because of the love he's got for God. And out of that love is born true obedience. And as he tells the young men, we're going to go to worship. There is no true worship without loving obedience. 
Abraham said to his young men, stay here with a donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship. We will return to you. He knew that God, Yahweh, loved him. Hebrews 11, 19 tells us exactly what Abraham was thinking. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he also received him back. The Bible tells us about that. Obedience. As the Lord is riding on the way to the temple, saturates the whole picture of this Passover festivity. Jesus tells them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there in a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. You see, we learn even from this, what may seem to be an insignificant event, that Jesus is God. He steals the storm. He quiets the fear of people's hearts. He raises the dead. He knows exactly where that donkey is. This word immediately repeats itself, is that there's no hesitation, both when God begins to work and in the way He wants us to obey Him. Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows about the donkeys that are in your life later on this week. He knows about the obstacles. He knows about the dangers. And He knows how to lead you. He's omniscient and he knows how to ordain. Remember the fish and the taxes? They had no salaries. They lived on what God provided and what people offered, but they had to pay taxes, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And Jesus tells Peter, listen to this, Matthew 17, 27. After he tells him, hey, who pays taxes, the sons or the strangers, right? Sons don't pay taxes. Good. Well, we got to give the taxes, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And Jesus says, however, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook, not a net. Sometimes when we pray and we ask God for help, we throw a net, just hoping we get something somewhere. Some people may look for a job and they may send out dozens of resumes knocking on those doors. My son, Brandon, he went to one place because that's the one place he believed God would give him the job. One hook, not a net. And not just that. Throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. Not the second, not the third. Not keep checking till you get it. First fish, one hook. Just like the right side. Open his mouth and you'll find the stator. Take that and give it to them for me and you. He takes care. He provides. Can you rest your heart in the Lord? Does the Lord know the donkeys that you need? Does he know your weaknesses? Even your wants? Yes, you can. And that's why we are compelled to obey him. John teaches us in 1 John 4, 19, we love only because he first loved us. It was his love that sparked love in your heart. The disciples, again, even as this command, they, they show obedience. And the disciples went and did just as Jesus instructed them. They went to a place not known to them. They went to find some donkeys that they did not tie down. They went to speak to a man that they did not know. They went to take away some donkeys that did not own. Don't try this on your own. That car does not belong to you. Even if you say, God said it's yours, right? But they went and they trusted, even placed themselves in danger. And we see obedience by faith, not just from them, but even from the owner. The owner lets the donkeys go. Simple. The master needs them. Take them. You may hear that sometimes from people coming to you. They may not use those exact words, but they'll be asking. 
the Lord teaches us to give without asking back in return. Give without asking for uh, interest. Give. Give. They want your, your uh, jacket. Give them your shirt as well. The owner lets the donkeys go, and the donkeys, well, they follow the Lord. Interesting, if you think about it, and any of you that know about horses, there's a few of you that own horses and know about horses. This was the foal of a donkey that had never been ridden. I used to break horses in when I was younger. There's a toll you take when you try to do that. Because the horse, especially a donkey like the heart of man, will not allow itself to be ridden so easily. You'll get bucked off. And the Lord is trying to show something here in a quiet way, the quiet strength of the touch of the master's hand. A, a, a coal, that, a foal that has not been broken in. Here's Jesus. And here's the idea. Because understanding the road that was to be traveled was a distance from that village to the temple. That young foal could not endure all that weight for all that distance. So the Lord possibly rode the donkey, the mother, first for the biggest part. And from the gate of Jerusalem to the temple, he rode on the young colt. And therefore, he rode both in kindness and wisdom and temperance. And his calm hand calmed down that donkey. And Abraham called the name of that place, Yahweh will provide. Yahweh Ra. My son, be obedient, though you may not understand. Be obedient, though you may be afraid. Be obedient, though it doesn't make sense. God will provide. As it is said in that day, in the mount of Yahweh it will be provided. As the Lord has always provided. In the immediate time, he provided for the upper room, which was not his. He provided fish for taxes. He provided food for the multitudes. Donkeys for this prophecy. And a cross for our salvation. Providing saving resurrection for us. We'll talk about Balaam's donkey some other time. We'll talk about the donkey the Lord rode some other time, but keep this in mind. In the book of Exodus, there is a command about the animals that could be sacrificed, which were clean, and the ones that could not be sacrificed because they were not clean. So we got this donkey on the way to the temple, but he has got no part of the temple because this donkey is an unclean animal. Exodus. Chapter 13, verse 13. The first of every animal was to be dedicated to the Lord. The firstborn son of every household was to be given to the Lord. However, but every first offspring of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your son you shall redeem. This law of the donkeys. Use them. Place your burden on them. Learn humility from them. But they're unclean. If you don't redeem them with a the lamb, you got to break their neck. What do you do with a donkey? He cannot be sacrificed at the tabernacle. Its unclean blood could not be sprinkled over the holy altar. The priests could not eat the meat of the donkey after it was sacrificed. The Israelite had only one choice. If you wanted to keep it, because you need it. Not everybody has a horse. You need a donkey. Who knows? Maybe you and I are called to be donkeys. Humble, 
obedient. Carry the burdens of one another. Do you know that donkeys... Do you ever see a, a flock of sheep? You see a mass of white. <laughs> what do you see in the middle? A donkey. Have you seen donkeys? In Australia, in Ireland, they began to put donkeys in the middle of sheep. Did you wonder, what's a donkey doing with the sheep? They have keen eyesight. They have great hearing. Like Balaam's donkey, he saw the angel where Balaam did not. And these donkeys are used to, to fight the coyotes and, and fight the, the wolves to protect the sheep. God uses them. But this donkey, if you don't redeem it, if the lamb would not die, would not be offered for the donkey, you'd have to break the neck of that donkey. Or redeem it. I don't know about you, but it may be true that I'm that donkey. Unclean before the Lord. Born in sin with a heart that is so wicked and deceitful. And there's this lamb that rode on the donkey to the temple and the cross that I would be redeemed, that you would find forgiveness so we would not have our necks broken by the law. So, don't have to be like Shrek. Don't have to be stubborn like a donkey. But let the Lord be the Lord that rules your heart. Calm your fears. Take your nature and bring it down to a level of peace as you serve Him and carry those burdens for His glory. Heavenly Father, You're so creative, so amazing. And You teach us and show us in the mirror of these creation of these creatures and things, your fingerprint, your love, all things being placed together to the glory of your Son. We pray that we would not be rebellious as Israel once was. And the rebellion he lives in right now, that you see them like a donkey on the, on the tops of hills, sniffing in the wind, looking for rebellion. Father, we want to be obedient, loving you. In the name of Jesus, we give you our hearts again. Quiet the storms in our lives. Fix our eyes upon you, Jesus, because you did it for the joy that was laid before you. Give us that joy in our hearts, for you are our king, humble, ruling the center of our lives. Amen.